Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the 411 Ground and Pound MMA Podcast. We are your weekly look into the wide, wacky, wonderful world of mixed martial arts. My name is Robert Winfrey, and I am your host for the evening. On the agenda tonight, or today, whenever you happen to be listening to this, I record it in the evening, so that's the time frame of reference I tend to use. Last night, UFC 272. The UFC was back on pay-per-view, and they brought a card. Uh... Not great, but not bad. So we'll go over all of the results from that, and there's quite a few things that there's quite a few things that we need to touch on as it pertains to that particular card. I think uh, there's a upcoming card, UFC on ESPN Plus 61, headlined by a somewhat mostly relevant light heavyweight title fight, title light heavyweight fight between contenders. Uh, Tiago Santos will be fighting Magomed Ankalaev, so we'll preview that entire card view this evening. And then news, the craziness around Cain Velasquez, and uh, I don't even know. That broke not long after I got done recording last week. I mean, really close to not long after. Uh, And that has been pretty crazy. Then I'll talk a little bit about that. Probably have to, I'll probably be using some vague language at times. There's Anytime we get into the real nitty-gritty of the legal uh, process, I try to be very careful. Uh, then we had fights announced and some cards finalized and whatnot, so just news of the week kind of stuff will be discussed as well. Uh, all right. Uh, oh, sorry. Before I get into the show proper, I'll be, I'll be brief. Uh, I've been doing a lot of thanks to all of you lately, uh, expressing my gratitude and whatnot for uh, just that you listen at all. Uh, and February was... Uh, I'm recording this on the 6th of March. February of 2022 was one of the best months, statistically, that this podcast has had. Now that's... This show has a fairly long history, and it's been, uh, I only mean recently, is kind of a long way around to say that. I, I really only mean recently, last, you know, three-ish years, three, four years. Uh, maybe closer to five, actually. Cow. Time, man. It gets away from you if you're not careful about it. But the last, uh, the last few years, February of 2022 was the best month, or what, or like, uh, tied for the best month uh, in recent history. And that's you guys more than pretty much anything else. So anything that you can do to help, even if it's just, you know, a, a like, a comment, following the podcast on whatever your podcast platform of choice happens to be, if you can get a star rating or a written review, if that's applicable, that all helps. And if you've done all that, please share the show with someone you know that you think will enjoy it, be that on social media in the digital space, or in the real interpersonal world, the one that scares me. (laughs) Uh, I kid. But any of that, any and all of that you can do to help is always, always, always appreciated, and I just need to express my gratitude to all of you again. So thank you very, very much. With that in mind, let's jump into the fights. So the main event, UFC 272. Colby Covington defeats Jorge Masvidal via unanimous decision, 49-46, 50 50-44, 50-45. Um, I was 49-45, I think. I'd have to double check. Um, one of the reasons I'm not going to stand too much behind my scorecard here pertains to the second round. The feed for the pay-per-view lost a minute and a half, two minutes of the second round. Uh, my my feed kind of cut off, and I was about to yell at, about Comcast, and then the ESPN Plus player has this thing. Sorry, technical difficulties working on fixing. So, and allegedly that was Masvidal's best round. You could maybe argue the fourth because he kind of got a knockdown. But even then, he was on the wrong end of everything else about that round, so eh, that's a little bit of a judgment call. Live, I think I gave that to Masvidal, but 
I'm not sold on that being correct. Um, the third round... Third round pretty easily could have been a 10-8 for Covington. Uh, if not the third, I think uh, the, the fifth also. Uh, th there's a couple of those rounds that I might be transposing specific moments from one round to the other as I think about it. I'm just going off of memory. But there was certainly a case for at least one round to be 10-8 for Covington, and I don't think that's outside of... Um, I, don't think that's, I don't think it's unreasonable. So, what kind of happened here? Uh, pretty much what everyone expected, I think. Uh, Covington, you know, spent the first round and a half or so. Again, I, I lost a big chunk of the second round, so forgive me for being off about that round. I just... I'm going to have to re-watch it later, once that's been restored. So, in the interim. A uh, lot of wrestling in that first little bit. Third round, a bit more striking. But uh, Covington kept his usual high pace. He did a lot of stance switching, which was a little bit surprising to me. Uh, it's not that he's never done that before, but he was really switching a lot in this fight. Masvidal did a pretty good job defensively on the feet. Landed some decent uh, leg kicks and body kicks. Uh, they split jabs several times, but any time that Covington would uh, kind of sustain a blitz, a chunk of the time Masvidal was able to angle, another chunk of the time uh, Covington had properly cut him off, so he had to go back into the fence. And then, I mean, from there, it's uh, a lot of clinch fighting, Masvidal's takedown defense against the cage is still quite good, but Covington's absolutely relentless with his wrestling. And not just getting the takedown. People, I've, I, I like Robin Black's description of this, so I steal it on the occasion that it becomes relevant. Wrestling is not getting a takedown. Wrestling is everything that happens until someone concedes a position. And whether that's on the feet or on the mat... We kind of, uh, especially in the MMA community, we will use different vernacular for this, but we call scrambles. You know, that's wrestling, if you want to be more accurate. So there's a lot of that stuff that goes into uh, what Covington does, because there were sequences where Masvidal would uh, would do something that, hey, maybe he's got something going here. You know, he would, uh, <clears throat> if he was underneath, sorry, I've, uh, my throat's been a little bit wonky, so I apologize if I sound a little bit different or uh, whatnot. But there were sequences where he would get up and try to come up on a single leg, and against a lot of guys, that'll work. Covington's able to get around, to, you know, uh, push down on the head, spin around behind him. Masvidal would get, uh, he got a pretty good front headlock sequence. Uh, he, ha he has one as a general rule, and he was able to get it a few times here. Anytime he did, Covington would just kind of start wrestling forward from his knees until they hit the fence and then come up and get a takedown from there. Like This fight was a gr is a great case study in the difference between someone who is a very good wrestler. And Jorge Masvidal is a good wrestler for MMA, a, a very good wrestler for MMA in some respects. But taking on someone who is... Uh, who, for whom wrestling is second nature, right? Co Col Colby Covington's been wrestling since, I don't know, he was a kid. I mean, the, the guy wrestled in college, of course, but I, did he, I, ass I just assume he wrestled when he was, you know, single digits. Uh, yeah, I know he did in high school. At, at a, if he if you're that if you're as successful in high school wrestling as he was, you wrestled when you were younger. Like you don't very few people start wrestling in high school and are that successful, especially if you're in a somewhat competitive wrestling area. So he he's probably been wrestling since he was you know 10ish. Might even, might even be single digits. Like, like this guy's been wrestling the vast majority of his life. And there's a difference between someone who knows how to wrestle, and Masvidal knows how to wrestle, don't get that confused, and someone who has built it into an instinct like that. 
And there were just sequences where you, if Masvidal hits some of those same attempts and same moves on someone who isn't Colby Covington, he gets the reversal. He gets a control position. Like, he makes it work. And it would work against someone who's not Colby Covington. But anytime you wrestle with Colby Covington, you're pretty much going to be at a disadvantage. I mean, that's even somewhat true of Kamaru Usman. Usman didn't really want to wrestle with Covington when they fought. And I'm not saying Covington's a better wrestler in the amateur system necessarily than Usman. I I genuinely have no idea uh, who would who would potentially win a wrestling match, a straight wrestling match between those two. I don't. Uh, but I know that when they fought, the first fight neither of them did a whole lot of wrestling. The second time when Colby kept trying, Usman did not want that. Now. Maybe he felt his advantage in the on the feet was so overwhelming he didn't need it. But there was a concerted effort on his part to not engage in that particular area of fighting for whatever the reason, and obviously it worked out for him. I'm not that that's that's an acknowledgement of uh, kind of the st- uh, kind of the reality here that no one really wants to wrestle with Colby Covington. Now Usman. It has had the most success of anyone at stopping the wrestling, but he didn't stop it by being the by he did not stop it by out wrestling him in the traditional sense of the we're going to wrestle and I'm going to wrestle better than you. He stopped it by never letting Colby create prolonged engagements. Now again, those are two different things, and it obviously worked out very well for Usman. But just wrestling with that guy for the sake of wrestling with him is. That seems like a bit of a fool's errand in some respects. It's really hard. Not that you can't get him down. I mean, Rafael dos Anjos took him down when they fought. Uh, but anytime you engage with him in a prolonged wrestling sequence, it seems almost impossible to come out on top. It, again, what Usman did was stop it from developing into a wrestling sequence. Covington would try something, and Usman would do everything he could to immediately separate. I'm going to stop the double leg, I'm going to sprawl real hard on you, and I'm going to, then I'm going to make sure we separate and go back to what I'm doing because I think I'm winning. Uh, it, it, I think that's just a little bit of what Colby Covington is so good at. Uh, there was a moment in the fourth, which was a round mostly dominated by Covington. In fact, he had a really long flurry of punches that he landed in that round. Uh when Masvidal was against the fence, you know, some of them landed pretty... Some of them were clean connections, too. Some of them were, you know, rolled with uh, very well because Masvidal does a pretty good job of that. And Covington's not exactly a power puncher. I don't think it's unfair to say that. Uh, but they got into a bit of an exchange, and Masvidal landed a really nice right hook. Uh, snapped Colby's head completely around. He dropped to one knee, got back up, and kind of got back... and. He didn't quite get back to work right away, but he bounced back up. Again, not even like... It was a knockdown in the technical sense. You know, the knee touched the ground. But he did not go... You know, He didn't even go to his seat. He certainly didn't go to his back. He went down to a knee, came up, and then Masvidal kind of started trying to press the, the, to press the action a little bit, but he got clinched up again and just did not go his way after that. Um... Yeah, it was that was Masvidal's moment. I mean, he had that was his that was his chance, and he landed a good punch. And against a lot of guys, that might have been enough. It was a good punch, man. That was a really solid punch from Masvidal. But you know, Colby Covington's chin really does need to be addressed. Uh, because he's got a good. I mean, that guy. Look at how much effort it took for Kamaru Usman to put him down in their first fight. And even then, uh, let me be clear, I am not saying that was a bad stoppage in that fight. It wasn't a bad stoppage. But even then, it was not... Uh, he, he did not knock him out. He did not put him in such a compromised position that there wasn't an argument. I was fine with the stoppage, for the record. Uh, but I'm not going to pretend that, you know, Colby saying, I, I think it was early, a little bit of sour grapes, a little bit of the competitiveness. Yes. hundred percent. 
But if Mark Goddard had let that fight continue, he would have been just as well within his right within his uh, discretion at that moment than he as he was to stop it. My opinion. And then their second fight, I frankly thought Covington won. I scored it for him. I'm not. I'm not, I wasn't screaming robbery at the end of that when Usman got his hand raised. Giving Kamaru Usman rounds one, two, and three in that in their second fight is perfectly acceptable. I gave Covington rounds three, four, and five, but uh, not a robbery at all. I, I did score that fight for him, and I think that deserves to be acknowledged. And that was a better version of Usman in terms of striking their first fight, and Covington actually did better in some respects. Uh, he's just really hard to hurt. Uh, this guy, you know, had no real fear of Robbie Lawler throwing bombs at him. In fact, turned in a nearly historic level of offensive output in the face of Robbie Lawler. He was not a not afraid to trade punches with Kamar Usman. He took some bombs from him. That and whatever else you want to say about Covington, I, I think we don't give his durability uh, and his chin enough credit. That guy is hard to damage, and he is hard to deter. Uh, and, again, that punch from Masvidal might have ended other fights, would have ended other fighters, Did not, was not enough on this night. Uh, if you don't mind a quick look at some stats, man... So, Colby Covington, if we look at the total strikes, he landed 218 of 338 total strikes thrown. If you break those down to significance, it was 94 of 201. Uh, that guy just doesn't stop, man. He just does not stop. It's it's a little bit crazy when you think about it. Just, he doesn't stop. <laughs> Uh, at all. He had 6 of 15 takedowns. In fact, he... Uh, I think he came, he became the like, sole holder of second place for most takedowns in welterweight history behind only George St. Pierre. Uh, I think the big thing that you have to give consideration to, another big thing for this fight, Covington was credited with 16 minutes and 14 seconds of control time. If you control 16 minutes of a, if you get credited with 16 minutes of control time in a 25-minute fight, that that says a lot. That says a lot. I mean, the other thing about Covington with respect to his pace, I mean, he threw. If we look at the total number of strikes uh, thrown round by round for Covington. 45 in the first, 63 in the second, 86 in the third, you know, that big flurry in the third, 70 in the fourth. He had a pretty big flurry in the fourth, too, now that I think. Three was the one where he had so much, uh, he had a lot of ground and pound in the third. Four, he had that big flurry against the fence against 70. And round five, he threw 74. That guy throw threw more in the fifth round of a fight, of this fight, than any other round except the third, which was his most authoritative, and the one that, uh, yeah, the, yeah, he had so much, oh, so much control time. He got three and a half minutes of control time in the first, only one in a, a little over one, one minute twenty in the second, four and a half in the third, four and a half minutes of control time in the third, and again four and a half minutes in the fifth, and then it was two and change in the fourth. There's not a lot of highlight real footage on Colby Covington. He doesn't have a lot of finishes. He's not he's not a submission wizard. He's not a big knockout puncher. He's not a dynamic kicker. He threw some decent kicks in this fight to his credit, but I'm, I'm making a different point. That He's not going to build a... You don't look back through his fights and have a built-in highlight reel in your head, right? Like, you think about other fighters, even some that had a lot of decisions on their record, you think about guys like George St. Pierre, you could still assemble a darn good highlight of GSP moments. And I bet if you if you were, you know, one of the guys, one of those of us who watched him when he was in his heyday and whatnot, 
you could probably assemble in your head right now a decent highlight reel of George St. Pierre. And a bunch of those fights went the distance. You don't quite get that with Covington in terms of you know, big punctuated moments or remember that time he landed that kick or that punch or that really sweet submission he pulled off. It's not that he never finishes people. I'm not saying that. I mean, he does have... Uh, let me quick look, actually. I think the majority of his fights are won by decision at the moment. Yeah, he has nine wins by decision, then four TKO slash KO and four submissions. Again, it's not that he never finishes anybody. But he does have a lot of decisions. And ultimately, he just presents such a nightmare to try and deal with. You know, Worley Alves, very earlier in his career, caught him in a guillotine. Other than that, it's been Kamaru Usman and no one else. Frankly, no one else has come all that close. I mean, if we look back at the rest of his... Give me a quick look here. Debuts in the UFC in 2014. Clear win. The Wagner Silva fight might have had a rough round. I'd have to double check that, but... Submits uh, Silva in the third. Beats up Mike you know, beats Mike Pyle over three rounds. UFC 187. Uh, that was a lifetime ago, and I'm pretty sure I covered it. Um, if I didn't cover it, I was watching it. Because uh, you know, I talked about it. Look at that fight anyway. Uh, yeah, yeah, Covington won that pretty clearly. Loses to Worley Alves, just gets caught in a guillotine show going for a takedown 90 seconds or so into the fight. Beats Jonathan Mounier, not close. Beats Max Griffin, not close. Beats Brian Barberina, not all that close. Dong Yin Kim, not close. Damian Maya, not really close. Beats Rafael Dos Anjos, that wasn't close. Beats Robbie Lawler, that wasn't close. Fights tooth and nail with Usman. Beats Tyron Woodley, that wasn't especially close. Fights tooth and nail again with Kamaru Usman and then beats Masvidal here. One moment of kind of, you know, getting rocked a little bit aside and Masvidal finding some work in the second. Uh, this wasn't an especially close fight. Like, the best guy in the world at this weight class, Kamar Usman, has to, had to fight tooth and nail to get by this guy. On both occasions they fought. It's... He just makes you fight at an unsustainable pace. And he is good enough to make sure that you have to fight him in a way that he is able to ex to excel at. And it's it's a night it's a nightmare to fight that guy. Nobody's looked good against him. I mean, he, and if you consider the first fight with him and Usman, going into the fifth round, the scorecards were four to one for Usman. 2-2 two, two, and 4-1 for, uh, excuse me, 3-1 to one for Usman, 2-2 two, two, and 3-1 to one for Covington. Now, Usman got the stoppage eventually, but, and the way that fifth round went, even if they had gone the distance that Usman would have won, would have been split, but he would have won. And then their rematch, the rematch was unanimous rather than split, which a little bit surprised me, but... Again, did Usman look great coming out of that fight? Uh, go rewatch the last couple of rounds in particular. Like he's there and he's competitive. He didn't. He was not saved by the fact that it was a five-round fight instead of a you know, seven-round fight, hypothetically. It wasn't that, but he he didn't look great. They were very competitive fights. So, uh, yeah, Covington's just. It's round after round after round after round of in your face, throwing a bunch of punches, throwing a bunch of kicks, then clinching you, then wrestling you, then Matt returning you and riding you and punching you. It's over and over and over and over and over again. And uh, it's just... <laughs> It's not something that anyone's able to consistently been able to deal with, in possible exception for Usman. Uh, now, I, I do want to note 
one thing that I th that was a little bit um, I, I took notes. I shouldn't say it's surprising necessarily. The last two fights, uh, the last two in particular, Covington has been out of American Top Team. He's been with MMA Masters. I forget exactly when that split happened. Um, so it, I'm mostly thinking about the Tyron Woodley fight. I can't remember if he was still with ATT when he fought Woodley or not. It doesn't really, it doesn't matter too much with regards to the point I'm about to make, but I'm not, I can't recall off the top of my head. Uh, but the, what I noticed is his last couple of fights, now, this might be somewhat impacted by fighting Kamaru Usman, Jorge Masvid, all these guys are not scrubs. It's taken him a bit longer to get going than it used to. Uh... He used to be a lot more on the gas, foot on the gas right away. The last couple of fights, that first round or so has kind of gotten away from him. Now I don't know if I don't know if that's a testament to the level of opposition, which is certainly not a factor that can be ignored, or if it's an issue of kind of prep and his new team not. It's not that his new gym is a bad gym at all. I don't mean to imply that. But there's, there's been a little bit of a slower start to him the last couple of fights, and I don't know exactly what to attribute that to in its entirety, or you know, what particular amalgamation of factors make that make up that reality, but it is something that needs to that I think needs to be acknowledged. I mean, the, the first round of this sounds crazy, but the first round of this fight, he only threw 45 strikes which is still a fairly high output for a five-round fight with another human being. But, I mean, the next round he threw 60, north of 60, then 80, 70, and 74. Like, that first... What did he do against Usman? Now I'm curious about this. He fought Usman... Yeah, again, he only threw 40, he only threw 47 in the first round. Then 48, 59, 83, and 61. Uh, that, that, that first round has become a bit of a, become a bit of an issue for him. Yeah, when he, uh, I mean, just for comparison, because we're dealing, we can go with a bit more uh, closer in proximity. When he fought Woodley, the striking, the strikes attempted round per round were uh, 59, 55, 60, 123, and then 14. The fight ended, of course, in the fifth. Uh, which is why there were only 14 strikes thrown in that round, because it ended a minute and 19 seconds into the round. But that's just you know, one fight removed. Now, Tyron Woodley obviously is not Kamaru Usman, and that's part of what's going on here. But I, I do wonder if there's a prep issue going on that makes him a bit more hesitant, a bit more cautious, or just feel like he needs to take a bit more time to kind of get rolling. I mean, once he starts going downhill, it's, oof. it is all, he is a, he is an avalanche, right? That guy's a tidal wave. And once he gets, once he gets going, it's just almost impossible to get deter that so uh, after the fight he called out uh, Dustin Poirier which I don't know what exactly the angle here is I mean I know that Poirier took exception to Covington's personality when they were at American Top Team and he and Ma and, and there was some public when I say public I mean like you know, mostly social media based like but public kind of animosity between the two I'm so it might be a bit of that I also but he wants to be back in the title picture he wants another shot at the belt if you believe what he says and when it comes to his career aspirations I don't have any problem believing him that he wants another crack at the belt he's frankly the at the moment, just at the moment, 
At the moment, he's kind of the only welterweight I think has a legitimate shot at beating Usman. So, but when you've lost twice, you know you do have to make a pretty significant case. And it's not that this wasn't an impressive fight statistically, or when you when you know how good Jorge Masvidal is, that it's not impressive to what he did. But it also wasn't the kind of th- emphatic statement that you might need if you're you know 0 and 2 against the champion to to get a third shot so i, I the the point there is if he might view Dustin Poirier as a relatively easy fight stylistically i'm not entirely sure i agree with that assessment but I would favor him over Poirier, and I think very highly of Dustin Poirier, but I would favor Covington if they were to fight at welterweight. Poirier still has a fair bit of name value. I mean, the guy's beat Conor McGregor twice and then fought for the belt last year. So he might be looking at a fairly high-profile opponent. That's a easier stylistic matchup that he could you know, notch another win against and start kind of building some more momentum. The other oppor- the other possibility here, I don't know how viable this is, and I'm not sure about the timing of all the participants involved, but there's a there's a decent chance he could fight the winner of uh, Hamzat Shemaev and Gilbert Burns, which is set to be coming up soon, uh, which is a really good fight. But I think the reality is, if, if Hamzat Shemaev blows the doors off of Gilbert Burns, they're just going to give him a title shot. I I don't know what Usman's immediate schedule is like, so... Because he doesn't have a fight coming up. Uh, he, yeah, they have not announced his next uh, title challenger yet. And I don't think they will until we see what happens with Burns and uh, Shemaev. But... He could fight the winner of that. The only problem there is that does leave, you know, your your champion without a clear challenger because those would be the next two guys theoretically. Right? So I don't know how realistic that is. I think Covington might be taking a look at that and going, you know, I can get another pretty big fight. Uh, if I if I fight Poirier, it's a safe-ish fight. Poirier is no one's easy fight. I don't mean to say that, but fighting Dustin Poirier at welterweight or fighting Kamzat Shemaev at welterweight, you know, which of these presents less risk if you're Colby Covington? I don't think it's unfair or out of line to say that Dustin Poirier presents less risk. Might, if they make that fight, Poirier might still be able to knock him out I'm, or you know, catch him in a guillotine or any number of things. Dustin Poirier is a very, very good fighter. But Less risky than Hamzad or even Gilbert Burns, for that matter. So I, That might be playing into his thinking here. Who knows? He might genuinely still be bitter about what happened with American Top Team and wants to make money and take out some of his frustrations on Poirier. I, I, I don't know. But it was a bit of an odd call-out, but I he might just be giving himself options. So uh, I... I don't know exactly what's next for him. He's still maybe the second best well, you know, no worse than the second best welterweight in the world based on current evidence. So I, I don't know exactly what's next, but there's options, and the man is still very much a player in that top of that division. Whatever you think about his personality and whatnot, or however unappealing you find his fighting style, the man wins. The man wins consistently. Uh, as for Masvidal, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, you know, a fight with Connor is still kind of hanging out there, potentially. But you know, this was the first time I watched Masvidal fight, and he kind of looked a little bit more old by the end of it. I'm not saying washed. Again, he was in this fight. He didn't really kind of fall apart or get broken down until the tail end of the fifth and at that point you know 
who can who can really fault the guy for not being quite as peppy in the fifth round of a fight with Covington as opposed to the first or the second. But he just, I mean, Jorge Masvidal has been a very, very good fighter for a, a lot longer than people have realized it. He's been really good at pretty much everything for a long time. But the guy's also been fighting for a long time. I mean, his professional debut in mixed martial arts, hang on, was 2003. I was a junior in high school when he started fighting professionally. He and I also are about the same age. Yeah, we're like, we're very close in age. But yeah, I was in high school when that guy started fighting. Well, junior or senior, depending on what was May. That either... Yeah. That would have been like tail, middle to kind of towards the back half of junior year. Uh, and this guy's out there, you know. At, so he's been fighting since 2003, professionally. He's got 51 fights. To say nothing of all the gym fights. To say nothing of all the backyard street fighting he did as a... I mean, he did that. We know he did that. There's video... Of, he was one of the... Uh, when when uh, Kimbo Slice was kind of gaining notoriety as fighting in the, the backyards of Miami. You know, Masvidal was one of the guys who fought on that... Put air quotes around it if you want to. He fought on that circuit. That, those videos of him doing that exist. Uh, this guy's been at this for a long time. For a really long time. Uh, and that that might just be kind of catching up with him. I'm not suggesting he's going to have to retire tomorrow or anything, but he's 30, what, 7? Yeah, he's 37. With over 50 fights. He's just... There's a shelf life here, and I think he's, we might be kind of approaching the end of his. Another, I mean, look, is he still going to be competitive with a lot of the welterweight division this year? Yes. Next year? Probably. The year after that? I don't know. So, I think it's kind of the point in time with his career uh, that I don't think the title is reasonable a reasonable expectation anymore but there's still some pretty big fights you could make he can easily be a guy that takes kind of the celebrity fights and I don't, I don't mean celebrity disparagingly i mean like the big kind of fan friendly fights you know him and connor is when i say it's a celebrity fight it's not that neither of those gentlemen can fight they both can quite clearly but neither of them is really in the title picture uh it would just be you know, a, a, a fan-friendly fight, not a not the most title-relevant fights. Uh, but that's you know, I think that's kind of the phase he's entering, and I mean, in all those years, all those fights, like God bless him for making as much money as he can at this point in his career. I hope he gets paid everything he is oh he is deserved, and we all know that's not enough. He is not being paid enough. But I, I think this one, this loss kind of pretty firmly establishes that he's, he's not title, he's not a title contender at this point anymore. So, that was your main event. Didn't hate the fight, the technical difficulty was, I was pissed, and then I just started laughing the longer it went on, because what else are you going to do? I'm, I'm going to call up, you know, ESPN and complain, like, all you can do is either get pissed or laugh. So I did both, choosing to laugh second and come in, come back into the fight with a better attitude about it. So that's yeah, that was your main event. Co-main event. Well, this changed up. It was supposed to be Rafael dos Anjos and Rafael Fiziev. I previewed that. Then on Monday, 
news breaks that Rafael Fazeev has tested positive for COVID. Can't make the fight. There was a little bit of a Twitter dust up between Islam Makashev and Rafael Dos Anjos, where Makashev was like, come fight me at 170. Dos Anjos was like, hey, how about 165? And they just kind of got chippy. I do wonder how much of the tweets that came out of Makashev's account were him versus Ali, because his manager is Ali Abdelaziz, and a lot of the tweets that come out of fighters ref by Ali are written by Ali. Uh, that's that's not a secret. <laughs> it's 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 really not. So I wonder how much of that was that. Um, didn't wind up going that way, and that seems to have. That seems to have slightly aggravated Dana White because he uh, it he said kind of after the fact when asked about it, yeah, Islam turned it down. I don't I don't necessarily believe that from coming out of Dana. Uh, they might have had terms that were awkward, and again, it might have been a lot of not Islam Makashev tweeting. Uh, so he turned it down, and so now we're gonna try to remake the Daryush fight. Ugh. I went over this I went over this last week when I talked about Makashev and Green and some of the reaction that people had to that fight. We still don't have a timetable for Daryush's return. Seems he seemed to get a, an indication from the doctors that he could avoid surgery, so he's gonna try the physical therapy route. We'll see if that works, but again, there's not really an idea about when he's gonna be back, so we're gonna sit you know, your really hot contender on ice. For that, Ugh, stupid. But again, the UFC could backtrack on that tomorrow, and no one would be surprised. Uh, anyway, instead of so instead of long story short, there instead of Rafael Fiziev, in steps on five days' notice, Hanato Moicano. They agree to a catch weight of 160 pounds, still five rounds. The first three round, the first two rounds of this fight were won clearly by Rafael dos Anjos, but they were um they weren't you know they were blowouts necessarily right uh the striking on the feet somewhat even you know dos Anjos is landing some good lefts land some good body kicks his usual stuff he then gets takedowns works his top game the ground game in this was interesting because there was a bit of nullification that went on. Moicano was good enough to stop a lot of the advancement from Dos Anjos and then regard whenever he did get past. But either because of strategy or energy or because of how good Dos Anjos is or some combination, he was never, almost never, able to reliably get up, get up out from underneath Dos Anjos. Which led to Dos Anjos having a lot of top control time. Uh, in fact, if we go by the numbers here. I am curious. Yeah, Dos Anjos was given a total control time of 13 minutes and 22 seconds. Three minutes and change in the first. Almost three minutes in the second. Three minutes in the third. Th almost four in the fourth. And then 28 seconds in the fifth. The fifth round's a little bit awkward here, but... First two rounds are Dos Anjos. No real controversy here. He went. He lands the better strikes. He gets the takedowns. Like he's, they're his. Those are his rounds. But it's not. It's not a big blowout. Then we get to round three. And in round three, Dos Anjos is winning pretty handily again. Then he lands a head kick. And sends Moicano kind of stumbling around. He jumps on him. Tries to get the finish, but gets a little bit caught up in the grappling. He winds up on top, and he just beats the crap out of Moicano. That's a 10-8 round for me. But I think everyone with a brain in their head, considering we're using the new scoring criteria. But one judge. Um, is there a judge that didn't? No, that, that was a universal... It would have been a universal 10-8. Uh, How'd we get to 49-44? I'll have to do the math on that again later. I, I, anyway, universal 
knocked down off a head kick, nearly finished him, ba pretty badly damages the left eye of Moicano, has his face marked up, he elbows him a lot, like, it's a 10-8 round. At this point, there's a very real argument for stopping this fight. Now, this is MMA, and no corner will stop a fight. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yell about this in just a little bit more in a second, but there's an argument for stopping this fight between rounds because Moicano lost the first two rounds, clearly. Not devastatingly, but clearly. And then gets smashed in the third. He, They set him up to come out for the fourth. The doctor devil checks his left eye, which is swelling, but the doctor says, he, doctor, you know, can you see? He says he can. The doctor does whatever examination he does and then says mm, he can see. So I have no objection to the fight continuing. The fourth round is not quite as bad as the third, but it's still bad. Uh, another 10-8 from my scorecard, for the record. Uh, gets him down again. Uh, fairly easily, actually. It was one of one on his takedowns here. He, he just... Moicano... <sighs> Let me finish this recitation first. More takedown, you know, take more ground control, more elbows. Just a really... And at the end of the fourth, Moicano's left eye is swollen even worse. He's bleeding from a couple of other places. His face is a mess. He's got no real chance at victory. And everyone and their dog is saying, you know, they, his corner should stop this fight. There's no reason for this. His corner, of course, do the do what MMA corners do. They give him advice and send him back out there to die. In this case, it was keep the jab going, throw the knee, and you can win this fight. And he really couldn't. Uh, b before the round starts... The referee, in this case it was Mark Goddard, gets the doctor to check on the eye of Moicano again. Because it's swollen more, the doctor examines it. Moicano again says he can see. I'm pretty sure he was lying through his teeth. But then again, maybe not. I mean, the swelling was pretty bad, but the eye itself did not appear to be swollen completely shut. I have no doubt his peripheral vision was negatively affected. But there's a difference between it being negatively affected and you not being able to see at all. And that does deserve to be acknowledged. Doctor goes back to the ref and says, he says he can see, I can't disprove it. If you stopped it, it's it would be okay, but it's on you. I'm not making, I'm not saying it needs to be stopped. So Mark Goddard looks at Moicano, who is battered and bloodied. The doctor made him walk a little bit, and he was a touch unsteady, but nothing that made the doctor wave it off, I guess. Mark Goddard looks at Moicano and says, I'm giving you 30 seconds once we start this round. If you don't show me that you're still here, I'm stopping the fight. Which is something you see a bit more of in boxing. You, you tend to get a bit more of the ref going to a corner between rounds and going to a fighter between rounds and going, if you don't show me something, I'm stopping it. Now, some of that's the three-round, the three-minute nature of boxing. It's easier for the ref to find that kind of time in a fight when you're three minutes and then one. But you see that a lot more in boxing. It, it's it's a thing I I don't hate. I will not hate it if that makes its way into MMA. I really won't. So he tells Moicano that, and Moicano then does enough. Arguably, the fifth round was Moicano's best round, believe it or not. Uh. The other thing that happens here in the fifth is Dos Anjos, he takes his foot off the gas. I don't know why. Maybe it was a bit of ring rust, which he said he felt. Maybe it was a bit of his cardio and he's not quite sure. Maybe it's maybe it's human compassion in the moment to not want to bludgeon and disfigure this other human being anymore. When you've got the win, don't do anything stupid. And I don't have to hurt this other human being anymore. I say this frequently when it comes to stuff like this, fighting in general. And, pe and I, I think people need to remember that this is true. Doing violence to another human being is traumatic. 
it, it's traumatic to be the victim of violence, million percent. Everyone fixates on that, and for good reason. I understand why that gets the lion's share of attention, but doing violence is, and I'd have to get deeper into the psychology, and I'm not equipped, and I'm not nearly enough of an expert to talk about this in detail to be to do kind of comparative, is it more traumatizing to be the victim of violence or the perpetrator of violence? I don't know. It's probably a debate amongst experts, because that's all experts do is debate amongst themselves half the time. But doing violence is damaging. It's why, you know, when you... Uh, you know, terrible things that you... Uh, when you, like, uh, African warlords, I bring up African warlords because I know this happens in Africa. When they make child soldiers, and I, this probably happens in other places too, I just, I know this happens there. One of the things you make them do when you are destroying their personality and their psyche and getting them to be, you know, eight-year-olds who will wield AK-47s and shoot them at whoever you tell them to shoot them at, you get them to kill people. Because doing that breaks you. Doing violence to another human being is... Again, it is a traumatic thing, and fighters sign up for this, and I'm not saying it's as... Again, it's not nearly as traumatic as other violence that people do to each other. But... You have to have a certain kind of constitution to make your living hurting another person. There are plenty of... People who, on a technical level, if you look at martial skills, are better than people in the UFC. But when the rubber meets the road, things don't always work for them. And it's not always, you know, a weakness in the sense that I don't like to be hit. Sometimes it's just I don't want to hurt somebody else. And... It's entirely possible that in that moment, in the fifth round, Rafael dos Anjos decided he did not wish to hurt Renato Moicano any more than he had to. He took his foot off the gas, I think, again, for whatever reason. He took his foot off the gas, maybe get dropped that round again for two of the judges he did. The official scorecards were 50-44, 49-44, and 49-45. I think the 49-44 would have been, what, two 10-8s, and then you give Moicano the fifth? I'm not sure on the math on that, but either way. And eh, it goes the distance. I gave I gave Dos Anjos all five rounds. I gave him a 10-8 in the third. I gave him a 10-8 in the fourth. So I was 50-43. So, uh, we're going to have to have this discussion again here, I guess. Hinato Moicano fights out of a good camp. He fights out of, uh... Where does he fight out of? Now that I think about it, is he, is he out of American Top Team? Or is he out of... Yeah, he fights out of American Top Team. So, he's got good corners. He has a good camp behind him. These are not, you know, people who don't know what they're doing. And yet, and yet, this man took 10 minutes of abuse he, that did not need to, he did not need to take. This fight could have and arguably should have been stopped in the, after the third. After the third. I... There might have been a moment after the head kick when the referee could have stopped it, but I don't, <clears throat> I don't think the amount of offense from uh, Dos Anjos ever got so urgent and immediate that I think I, I'm, I'm not screaming that there wasn't a stoppage at any point during the third, right? There's, there might have been a moment when you could argue it, but on the whole, I. Dos Anjos was never able to really force the issue. But between rounds, you know, what was served by sending him out for the fourth, where he took, what do you take officially, 22 significant strikes? 
27 total, got taken down, controlled for almost four minutes. What was served? What was served by sending him out for the fifth? Well, maybe he won the round. So what? I absolutely mean this. So what if you thought he won the fifth? Did he ever get close to a stoppage? No. Not remotely close. Did he... Did he gain experience from this? In some way that you maybe you, you... Maybe he's just getting more... I mean, there's no possible reason for this. Not I shouldn't say that. There's not really a justifiable reason for that. Everything after that third round did not have to happen. All that happened was more abuse. For... And it's not like you're... I understand that sometimes this can be a difficult call. I, I really do. There's a ton, in some cases, of nuance that go into this and a, a million variables, right? A million of them. But let's consider the variables at play here. You have a guy who took this fight on four days, four or five days' notice. Has had no camp for this fight. Has been on the wrong... Has lost every round up to and including the third, and he almost got finished in the third. And he's fighting. If you want to talk about another variable to consider, let's consider the opponent, shall we? He is not fighting someone with a history of gassing out. He is not fighting someone with a history of weak submission defense. He is not fighting someone who constantly slips on banana peels. He is not fighting someone who you could reasonably conclude the worst is over and we still have a shot. He's fighting one of the most seasoned, high-profile veterans. I've said this before about Rafael dos Anjos. That man is an all-time great that no one's going to remember as an all-time great. It's a crying shame, but I think that's what he's kind of destined for. You're fighting a seasoned, durable, well-rounded fighter who has beaten you everywhere and just about finished you in your last fight in your last round who has a long history of fighting five rounds against crazy levels of opposition and not breaking not cracking not crumbling not falling apart not making catastrophic errors and you decide to send your fighter out there again against that guy on no camp, on less than a week's notice, after taking a 10-8 round. Why? And then you do it again after the fourth, which, granted, not as bad as the third, but not... Like, he didn't win the fourth. He didn't even have a competitive fourth round. That round could have been a 10-8. I thought it was. <sighs> MMA corners are not going to wise up to this until people die. And people are going to die. Stuff like this is how people get killed. Stuff like this, even if you don't, even if you don't die in the cage, or, you know, get taken to the hospital and, you know, th- a week later, we're having to read the story about how they had to take you off life support, even if you don't quite get that. Let's let's remove this one step further, shall we, from the immediacy of this fight. This is the kind of this is the kind of thing. Not this fight. I'm not pointing to this fight in particular with Anato Moicano and saying this man will never be the same. But this kind of logic and this kind of decision making. And these kinds of behaviors are what lead to fighters having no quality of life when they're 50. Y'all try to hear James Tony talk lately? And that guy didn't take a whole lot of head trauma. Took some, but not a whole lot. Have you seen Thomas Hearns? I could give you a list of boxers longer than my arm. 
I really could. And we're not that far from that being MMA fighters. In fact, frankly, it already is. But nobody likes to talk about it. And I don't blame you. It's a that's a hard subject, man. When you talk about the toll this takes on your body and your mind. When you read about what happened to Spencer Fisher and where he is right now. And then you think back on watching those fights. I don't blame anyone one bit when they when they have uh, when they decide that watching combat sports is not for them because they under they know the human cost and that's not something they're that's not a this is not an exchange they're willing to make in in, in terms of their personal what they want to do to watch I, I I don't blame anybody I've made my peace with it as a general rule but you can only make peace with it and really make peace with it when you've taken a real hard look at the reality of this. I'm not saying Hanato Moikano is, you know, going to be uh, abjectly or permanently damaged by this one fight. Because I don't know that. Here's what I do know. This stuff adds up. And it adds up faster than you think. And and there is a long-term cost to this kind of decision-making by people who are there to protect the fighter. Right? I'm going to assume that you watch... Maybe not as much MMA as I do, but probably a fair bit, or pretty close. I watched Anthony Smith get his teeth knocked out by Glover Teixeira. I assume a lot of you did. That's going to have, what Glover Teixeira did to him is going to have a long-term effect on that man. Now, what that is in particular, who knows, but it is. And it didn't have to happen. Now, I get... You, know, you ask Anthony Smith about it, he doesn't regret it, he appreciates what his corner did, blah, 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 blah. Like, I, I get that he is an individual, I know where his stance is. But... I, if you talk to older fighters about this kind of stuff, there's a lot of them that regret it. There's a lot of them that regret some of those rounds of abuse that they get, they got to go out on their shield and be a warrior and show their heart and I ain't no and I there's no quitting me and then you're 56 and you have pounding headaches and you occasionally forget your wife's name or your kids names or how to drive from point A to point B I mean, uh, that's reality, guys. And I didn't need to know how tough, I didn't need to see rounds four and five of this fight to know that Hanato Moikano is a insanely tough individual. I already knew that. So did you. Well, now we really know. Now we've seen, no, no. This was unnecessary. This was utterly unnecessary. His corner should have stopped this. And they didn't. And they should have. More than anybody else. You know, I'm even going to give the doctor the benefit of the doubt here on this one. Partially because he's... If you're doing an eye exam, there's a chunk of it that you can only do and you just have to assume that the guy you're... that the person you're examining is telling you the truth. And if they're lying through their teeth and you don't have any, you don't know any better, what else are you going to do? But I'll give the doctor the minor benefit of the doubt there. I'll even give the ref 
a little bit of the benefit of the doubt because you could have made a case for a mercy stoppage maybe somewhere in the fourth, maybe, but even then, Dos Santos was never able to mount a real sustained kind of offensive flurry that forced the referee's hand. And some of that's on, that's really just kind of how their skills matched up. I mean, and I even give, you know, I give the ref credit for telling Moicano, you know, the doctor's not going to stop this. Your corner's not going to stop this. He told, I mean, the ref told the doctor, I want you to look at him. I want to see how he looks when he stands up because I know his corner's not going to stop this. Like, he was cognizant of that fact. And telling the fighter, you've, you know, you've got a small window to prove to me that I should should let this go. And then between Dos Anjos backing off and Moicano being the insane human being that he is, he was able to kind of do enough to warrant the fifth round happening, I guess. But it, it didn't need to happen. Nothing was learned. There was no real chance of victory for Moicano. And every single one of the variables that you might be able to argue is in favor of stopping that fight. Every one of them. How's the trajectory of the fight going? Going pretty bad. Have we had any punctuated moments that show we might have a shot? Nope. Does our opponent have a historic weakness that we're trying to exploit? Nope. Have we had a, you know, have we worked really, really hard to get here and had a really good training camp? And yeah, that was a rough round, but I know you can bounce back because I've seen you in the gym. And I know how hard you've trained. Nope. Four days, four or five days. Nope. Well, you know, the other guy looks to be slowing down. So rough round, but it's okay. We can come. Nope. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I've heard Trevor Whitman talk about this on occasion. And the thing he's mentioned is part of what the reason they do this is uh, is the pay structure. And I I don't mean raw numbers. I mean the show and win bonus structure. And that's one of the only... I still find it unethical. Let me be clear about that. But that is, I think, the most understandable reason uh, to to do that. And even then, I find it lacking. Uh, I'm not saying Hanato Moicano is never going to be the same after this fight, but also does need to be noted, he's taken a lot of damage, not just here. I mean, he's a really good fighter. But he and Brian, or- he and Jeremy Stevens had kind of a knockdown dragout affair. He and Brian Ortega had a war. Man, those two beat the crap out of each other. Uh, Jose Aldo put a pretty serious beating on him. Chan Sung Jung stopped him in less than a minute. You know, Fazeev stopped him. Uh, the other two fights after the Fazeev fight and before this one, he rebounded okay, but he's had some of these fights. Like, you're... That might be the other thing, you know, the other kind of uh, consideration. Well, you've you've not taken a ton of abuse in your career. No, he's kind of he's kind of had some of these losses. I, just, I don't know. I I know what it's going to take, and I dread the day that it happens. But behavior like this makes it inevitable. That's all there is to it. I don't know what's next for Dos Anjos if they try to remake the Fazeev fight. He kind of said he would like to fight Jorge Masvidal at 170. I don't know how realistic that is. Uh, there's there's a lot of uh, directions that Dos Anjos could go next, but whatever it's worth, he looked good. And I mean, Dos Anjos is just one of those old war horses, man. He's 37. And he's kind of the same age. Very close to the same age as Jorge Masvidal, if you look at their like month of birth. Uh, he's got 44 fights. He's been, he debuted in 2004. This guy's been around, man. He's been with the UFC for a long time, right? 
Yeah, he debuted for the UFC in 2008. He, he's been in the trenches, man. Through welterweight, through lightweight and welterweight, he has fought. That dude has fought everybody, and a bunch of them are some of the toughest guys in their division. Poof. Sorry, I'm just looking over. For the sake of posterity, allow me to read off the fights of Rafael dos Anjos, his opponents in the UFC, starting with his first one. Jeremy Stevens knocked out. He gets knocked out in the third round after winning. The, but Jeremy Stevens, Tyson Griffin, Rob Emerson, Kyle Bradley, Terry Adam, Clay Guida, George Sotiropoulos, Glayson Tebow, Kamal Shalarus, Anthony Njikawani, Mark Bocek, Evan Dunham, Donald Cerrone, Khabib Nurmagomedov, Jason High, Benson Henderson, Nate Diaz, Anthony Pettis, Donald Cerrone, Eddie Alvarez, Tony Ferguson. That's all lightweight. Moving up to welterweight, Tarek Safady, Neil Magny, Robbie Lawler, Colby Covington, Kamaru Usman, Kevin Lee, Leon Edwards, and Michael Chiesa back to lightweight, Paul Felder, and Hanato Moicano. Dude. That man's UFC career has been trench warfare. That is, you fight up through no man's land and you grind for every yard of earth that you take. Against so, against some of the very best. He fought the best lightweight. He fought the best lightweights at the time. He fought the best welterweights. He's fought the two best welterweights in the world, in my opinion. That... Maybe the three, depending the three best, depending on where you want to rank Leon Edwards specifically. Like everybody, and he's still out here getting it done. And you know what? God bless him. All right. Uh, let's see. Next up, Oof. I gotta speed this up. I don't want to be here forever, and neither do you. Bryce Mitchell defeats Edson Barboza via unanimous decision. 30-25, 30-26, 30-27. Disagree with 30-27. There's at least one 10-8 round in here. The second in particular, I seem to recall. Heck of a performance out of Bryce Mitchell. Uh, Heck of a performance. That man... This was supposed to be his big test. Uh, Easily the best opponent he's ever faced. Uh, Pretty easily. And... Had to deal with some of the adversity that Barboza usually poses. Leg kicks, some body shots. But the grappling difference here was pretty serious. And this was one of the... Barboza looked a little... I hate to say it about the guy, but he looked a little bit washed here. If you look at what he did on the ground, it was just close guard. Hope for a stand-up. Uh, that that's kind of that was kind of what he brought to the table, and that might have been an effective strategy on bottom. Oh, twelve, thirteen years ago, late two thousands. I ain't cutting it in twenty twenty two. It's just not. Uh, Bryce just. Had him down, beat him up all three rounds. Dropped Barboza with a left hand in the first. Yep. Yeah, I I do wonder how much how much more Barboza has left in the tank. Um, they were saying on commentary, you know, the worst loss for Barboza in terms of like how badly he was controlled and whatnot since the Khabib Nurmagomedov fight. Kevin Lee immediately chimed in on Twitter and went, dang, I've been forgotten. Yeah, you did a number on Barboza. You also got caught with a wheel kick at one point and did the funky chicken. Like, Bryce Mitchell was never in danger here at all. So, that dude, Bryce Mitchell, I mean, he was on, he was on Helwani's show and he said some stuff that, a little bit crazy. But, he also came off okay here once he kind of settled himself down a little bit in terms of his public presentation. But that guy can fight, man. His grappling is really good. 
This should put him into the top ten of the division, and he should be fighting. He should be fighting up again. Like, that guy is a problem for that weight class. I still need to see what happens when he's on the wrong end of things. You have to be able to rebound uh, if you want to be like the highest level in the UFC or MMA in general. Like, you have to be able to come back after being the nail instead of being the hammer. And that's a hard thing to do. It really is, but somebody. You fight long enough, somebody is going to beat the crap out of you. You're, you're going to have a rough, you're going to have a rough round. You're going to have a rough couple of rounds. What do you do? And that's the thing you only we only find out about a fighter when they're put in that position, and no one's put him in that position yet. Somebody will, but he's he's a handful, man. He's undefeated. He's he's got to pay attention to. And I mentioned about Barboza. I. He's 36, which for featherweight, lightweight is uh, not old, but it ain't young. He debuted professionally in 2009. He's been with the UFC since 2010. We're talking about 33 overall fights. Yeah, I'm, he's had some rough losses along the way, too. Like His fights with Felder were... Those were wars. You know, Khabib and Lee both beat the crap out of him. Gagey knocked him out. Uh, the Burgos fight, he won it, but it was kind of a, it was kind of a back and forth thing. Uh, Giga Chikadze stopped him. Tony Ferguson carved him up like a turkey back in the day. Like he's he's had some rough he's had some rough fights. I I do think we're kind of he's on the downhill side of things at this point. I think. Uh, Kevin Holland uh, TKO'd Alex Oliveira via punches and elbows, 38 seconds of the second. First round a little bit back and forth. Second round, Holland kind of found himself. Nice little right hand to drop Oliveira and then just elbows from hell. A solid welterweight debut, at least as far as the UFC goes for Holland. Uh, curious to see what he can do at 170, but I think this is a bit more where he belongs. And kicking off the main card, Sergey Spivak defeated Greg Hardy via TKO, p- punches from Mount, 216 of the first. I I get that there are people who get a bit of schadenfreude, for want of a better phrase, out of Hardy's getting knocked out. I, just, I can't be bothered to. I, at this point, I just can't. This was the last fight on Hardy's current UFC deal. They might cut him. Or choose not to re-sign him. They might, they might also retain his services. For some reason, the people at ESPN seem to like him and have like having him on the UFC broadcasts. That's the only explanation I have for his for him being placed in the position on the cards that he is. He he was the kickoff fight for the pay-per-view on this card. No reason for it. Absolutely none. But there he was. Um, here's the other thing about this. Greg Hardy is just not very good. He's a very large man. And in his athletic heyday, he was a very good athlete. Whatever else you want to say about the guy. Absolutely a top-tier athlete. And he hits hard. But he is not that good a fighter. Look at how Spivak got him to the ground. Now, Hardy was probably 30 to 40 pounds heavier on fight night. Much larger man. And with the use of basically a single underhook after they clinch, Spivak misdirects Hardy and then hits a judo hip toss. Um, I forget the I forget the judo what the judo name for it would be. It wasn't a um, it's not a wizard kick or a, what is that in judo? Um, uchimata, wizard kick and uchimata are essentially the same technique. It was more across both instead of between the legs. So, Harai Goshi. I'm gonna double check that. Yeah, yeah. Or if there, or if there's a minor difference between this one and some other variation of it, I'm just going with Harai Goshi, and we can all deal with it. Uh, and just threw this man significantly larger than he was to the mat with ease. 
this is one of those videos that this is the type of like when people isolate this clip this is the type of thing that people will highlight and go if you want to learn how to defend yourself against a man this size well size doesn't really matter I can teach you how to do this come train with me and you know come take my two weeks self-defense course and I will teach you how to throw around a man the size of Greg Hardy because look this other man did it and he's so much smaller than Hardy never mind the fact that Sergei Spivak is only small when standing next to someone like Greg Hardy Sergei Spivak is 6'3 240 give or take it's a big man now yeah Hardy's bigger but it looked like that. Do you want to know how someone that much smaller than you is able to do that? And this is true. Go to any gym. Watch. And you might see it happen, especially if you're... A, this will happen to you if you're a larger guy. I'm not a huge guy. You know, I'm 6'6", six, six, something like that. I forget exactly. And I'm, you know, 220-ish. I'm not a small man. But I'm not big. I'm not a, I'm not a very big guy. Go to any go to any MMA gym or whatnot. Watch the first couple of times the bigger man is paired up with someone who is smaller. When you see them tossed like this, I you, even if you're not looking at something that like has a belt ranking, so you can just immediately see that somebody's better. Right? If you I mean if you walk if you watch you know, a judo class or a jujitsu class and you see they get you know the black belt or the brown belt rolling with the the white belt the size difference doesn't it makes sense you don't need to see the belt rank you see somebody that much smaller than you do that to somebody skill differential that is huge i mean huge that's that's what that is because if if greg hardy knew a bit that should not have been possible. Not like that. N not losing. Like Losing was always possible. Getting controlled and thrown like that should not have been that easy for Sergei Spivak. That's all I'm saying. Will the UFC retain Greg Hardy? Who knows? That's I think that's more ESPN's call at this point. If Hardy does get cut, I imagine he'll, wind he'll find his way to, like, bare knuckle. Where, frankly, he might be a better fit. We're just talking his abilities. Uh, decent enough win for Spivak. He's a heavyweight that gets kind of overlooked. But, you know, he's only got three losses. All three of them are in the UFC. And they're to Walt Harris, Marcin Tabor, and Tom Aspinall. Like, he's only lost to ranked guys. He may not blow you away with what he does when he wins... I mean, he actually tapped out Tai Tuivasa, don't forget. It was 2019, but he did it. But he's he's not a guy... He's a guy who knows how to win consistently at the UFC level. So, yeah, good for him on that. So, that was your main card. As for the prelims, Jalen Turner defeated Jamie Malarkey via TKO punches 46 seconds of the second round. Kind of a showcase for Jalen Turner here. Turner's a big lightweight. He's 6'3". Um, got a 77-inch reach. And long, you know, long legs, too. He's only 26. Uh, had a couple of setbacks in the UFC. He fought his debut when he fought Vicente Luque up at welterweight. Then he dropped a decision to Matt Frivola, but he's on a four-fight winning streak now. It might be time to step him up in, in class. Uh, he's he's got some serious skill. He is an accurate striker. He's smooth. Got some wrestling and grappling to work on, but he is young enough in terms of both miles and age that he could be a pretty serious player at lightweight potentially. Uh, women's strawweight Marina Rodriguez defeated Jan Charnon via split decision, 29-28. Um, 29-28 for either woman is perfectly defensible. Round one. Uh, Jans, round three, Rodriguez, uh, not a whole lot of controversy about either of those, so it comes down to the second. Second round, I gave it to Rodriguez, but 
Close round. Not a robbery either way. Pretty good fight. Um, Jan looked pretty sharp. But she slowed down a little bit as the fight went on. And once things got more into the clinch scenario, like the closer they got, the better Rodriguez did. And then once she was able to grab kind of the tie clinch, she just... Rodriguez likes to fight there. Uh, that's where she wanted this fight to be the whole time. Jan just did a good job through the first round and a half or so of fighting at distance, circling off the fence, not really getting tied up. Uh, pretty solid fight, actually. Rodriguez might be next for the title after this. Uh, we do have, I think, Rosen Esparza, the fight that I don't know if it's been signed or if that's just assumed at this point. But Rodriguez at the moment could be next. Uh, he's a very good fighter. Uh, let's see. Light heavyweight Nikolai Negumarian, who defeated Kennedy and Zechaku via split decision. What a clown fiesta this was. 29-27 for Zechaku, and then two 29-27s for Negumarian. The reason we get 29-27s here is a point deduction to Nzechiku in the third round after about the second time he poked Negamariano in the eye. The point deduction is entirely justified from where I said. You could score this fight for Nzechiku if you're... Uh, here's my problem with scoring this for Nzechiku. Um, It would mean you had to give him the third uh, not the third rather excuse me um i thought he did okay i thought he did more damage uh he just got controlled for long periods of time and how you kind of parse that can get a little dicey the fight wasn't great uh just as far as action fights it wasn't great i'm fine with nega mariano winning I, I could not possibly be bothered to, given how kind of crappy the fight was i'm not going to yell about the decision uh, Marina Moroz defeated Maria, excuse me, uh, defeated Maria, yeah, Marina Moroz defeated Maria Agapova via arm triangle choke, two, uh, 327 of the second. This fight was all Moroz. Um, first round a little bit closer, but the grappling was in Moroz's favor, and when she kept forcing it there, just uh, had Agapova's number. Dean Thomas, who was uh, a contributor to the broadcast, <laughs> Chiming in uh, in, in the second round at one point, you know, the, this is, I'm not surprised because this is what, ha this is used to what happened when they'd fight in the gym. <laughs> it looked, just looked exactly like this. Uh, good win for Moroz. Uh, pretty good post-fight promo from her. I mean, she's Ukrainian and so she got to talk a little bit about what's going on over there. So, uh, solid enough win. As for the early prelims, um, Umar Nurmagomedov beat Brian Kelleher via rear naked choke, 315 to the first. Umar Nurmagomedov is a problem for the bantamweight division. That man is good. He is very good. He's a good kicker. His hands need to come up a little bit in terms of their overall skill, but yeah, really good kicks. He's fast. His wrestling is good, and the way he got this choke was like lightning once he got kind of towards the back. That man's a problem. Flyweight Tim Elliott defeated Tegir Ulanbekov, a unanimous decision, 29-28. I disagreed with this decision. I gave Elliott the first. He won that pretty handily. I gave Ulanbekov rounds two and three. Um, yeah, some cheating from Tim Elliott. Uh, he had a couple of knees in the first that were borderline they were legal let me stress this legal but they were close then he did some like glove grabbing um yeah was not a not a fan of this decision uh i thought ulan bekov won it uh lightweight ludovic klein defeated Devontae smith via split decision there was a 29 28 for smith and a 29 28 and a 30 27 for klein I scored it for Klein. Smith has tools. He really does. But he fades down the stretch, and he does not do great in the face of adversity. I don't know how they want to try and handle that, but I think that's the way it is. Um, and light heavyweight, Dustin Jacoby defeated Mihal Oleksajic via unanimous decision, 29-28. Uh, 
decent enough fight here. Nothing, nothing groundbreaking or that any or that really sticks out in my head, but uh, not a bad fight. Uh, let's see, your bonuses. Fight of the night was Covington and Masvidal. Surprised me a little bit. Surprised me a little bit there. Uh, performances of the night: Kevin Holland and Marina Moroz. No objection to any of that. Uh, all right, so I want to thank everyone who read my uh, live coverage for that particular event over in the MMA Zone of 411 Mania. If you would like to read it and get my round-by-round -round coverage and uh, you know, my scoring <laughs> when uh, when I occasionally forget how I had it round-by-round -round when doing the show, that is over right now in the MMA Zone of 411mania.com. You can find my full report on the event. So to anyone who... To anyone who is uh, interested in that, please do give that a read and a click. I deeply appreciate it. All right. Let us... It's going to be a long one, folks. Let's move on. I'll try to be quicker through this. This shouldn't take nearly as long. Uh, UFC on ESPN Plus 61. Coming to your way from the UFC Apex facility. Headlines by Tiago Santos and Magomed Ankalaev. This is a relevant fight for light heavyweight, which is... Light heavyweight's up in the air right now. Uh, I told you my somewhat bold prediction for the year is that that belt is not successfully defended. Uh, I, I tend to think, if I had to guess at the trajectory, I think Yuri beats Glover. Won't be shocked if that goes the other way, but I'm picking Yuri. That's my that's my lean at the moment. Then I kind of think Ankalaev takes it from Yuri Prohachka. Like that that's my hunch. That's just my hunch. Uh, Tiago Santos finally got a win. He beat Johnny Walker by unanimous decision, um, October of last year. Lost three in a row before that. You had the John Jones loss that a bunch of idiots think he won. And yeah, I tend to think that if you scored that fight for Santos, you're not terribly cognizant of what's going on. Got beaten by Glover, uh, but destroyed both of his knees in that fight. Came back, fought Glover Teixeira, got beaten, lost to Alexander Rakic, beat Johnny Walker, but I think those I think those knee injuries took a lot out of him. Uh, and who could blame him? I mean, they were terrible. He's also 38 now. Granted, light heavyweight not quite the same as lighter weight classes, but you get close to 40 and still. Whereas Magomed Ankalaev is 29, is 16 and 1 on a, what, seven fight winning streak? Yeah. Um, can fight everywhere. Came into the UFC, believe it or not, as a ground and pound phenomenon. Turned into more of a striker. Uh, he can fight everywhere. Long guy. I mean, these are both large men. Um, I think they're both 6'3", officially. Santos is 6'2", Ankalaev is 6'3". I think Santos is bulkier. So, large men. <laughs> I would need a pretty... It's crazy to me... I'm going to echo Jack Slack if you listen to his podcast. It's crazy to me that Ankalaev's hype evaporated after that loss to Craig. It, coming into his UFC debut, he's undefeated. And proceeds to beat the crap out of Paul Craig for 14 minutes and 58 seconds. I mean, at least one 10-8 round. At least. Then in the last seconds, he gets caught in a triangle choke and has to tap. Literally with one second left in the fight. And for some reason, everyone decided after that, well, he's kind of a hype job and he got exposed. Never mind the fact that in his next fight... He head kicks Marcin Procneo in the first round, beats up Clidson Abreu, knocks out Dolce Longiambula with a front kick to the face, wastes 2020 fighting Iwan Kutalaba twice and stopping him twice, beats Nikita Krylov in his last fight, and beats Volkan Uzdemir uh, to close out 2021. This dude is really good. I need a compelling reason to pick against him. And while I respect the power of Santos, uh, I don't think he's that guy anymore. And I I favor on Kalaev here pretty heavily. 
Your bantamweight co-main event is a really good fight, too. Marlon Moraes and Song Yadong. <sighs> I like Marlon Moraes. I really do. But he is 1-4 and four in his last five. He's been finished in his last three. And I just... I don't... I don't know. I, I don't know that he ever adjusted after people kind of figured out how to attack him. Song is a really good fighter. He's only got one loss in the UFC. Uh, I kind of thought he lost the Casey Kenny fight. But, you know, he beat Julio Arce in his last fight. Uh, I've, I like Marais. I Like I said, I, I really do. But I, I don't think I can pick him at this point in time. Which hurts me to say, but I don't think I can. So I'm, I'm going with Song. Featherweight, Sadiq Yusuf and Alex Caceres. That's an interesting clash of styles. Uh, Yusuf, slightly shorter, more muscular, just likes to bomb on people. And then you've got the lankier, slightly more technician-based uh, Alex Caceres. They're both the same height. Caceres is longer of limb. I don't like picking Alex Caceres. It's... It, it, it's weird because I mean he's not a bad fighter. In fact, he's on a five-fight winning streak. Maybe I should. Won't be surprised if Yusuf beats him, but Caceres has a pretty good chin. Yeah, I actually am. I'm thinking I'm gonna lean towards Caceres here, and it'll just feel stupid when he gets blown out of the water. But so be it. Light heavyweight Khalil Roundtree Jr. and Carl Robertson. Uh, Roundtree had a win last year. He landed that, he landed a gnarly sidekick to the knee that, uh, that ended this fight with Modestus Bukowskis. Uh, whereas Robertson, I mean, we're dealing with two strikers here. These two are just gonna, that's what they're gonna do. He got tapped out by Brendan Allen, lost to Martin Vittori before that. I am going to lean towards Robertson here. I think Roundtree tends to struggle more with people who are happy to trade with, to strike with him. But, could be very wrong. That's a bit of a coin flip, uh, to be candid. See, Drew Dober will fight Terrence McKinney. Dober was supposed to fight Ricky Glenn. Uh, Terrence McKinney stepping in on short notice. Hmm. McKinney fought very recently. Dober's on a two-fight losing streak. I mean... Islam Akashev and Brad Riddell, so not like not like he's losing to anybody. I'm going to pick McKinney here, though, believe it or not. I don't know that Dober will hold up to him. Could be very, very wrong about that, but I mean, this is a step up for McKinney. A pretty notable one, but yeah, I'm going to lean towards McKinney. Middleweight Alex Pereja, the uh, former Glory kickboxing champion who famously knocked out Israel Adesanya. Uh, he is back, and he is fighting Bruno Silva. Sure, this is the right Silva that I'm thinking of. It is. Bruno Silva's not an easy fight at all. Yeah. I'm actually going to lean towards... Silva, it might be that might be very very wrong, but that's where I'm going to be at the moment. That's your main card. As for the prelims, Matthew Semmelsberger and AJ Fletcher lean towards Semmelsberger. JJ Aldridge and Jillian Robertson. I feel like I should lean towards Aldridge here. Yeah, I should lean towards her, and I think I'm going to. But uh, Jillian Robertson is. She's very up and down, but she's a she's a pretty darn good fighter. So you know what? No, no, Robertson. Leaning towards Robertson. Changing my mind. Bantamweight Trevin Jones and uh, Javid Basarat. Till I know how to properly pronounce that gentleman's last name, that's what I'm going with. Uh, Jones is coming off of a loss to Saeed Yakub Kakramanov. Uh, I believe this is the debut for 
Basarat. Let me... I would have remembered typing his name out, if nothing else. It's his debut. I want to see if he's... I believe he's coming in off the Contender Series, but I wish to confirm that. Uh, this gentleman is Afghani, undefeated. Yeah, Contender Series. Okay. Um, hmm. That is a slightly tougher pick than you might think. Probably going to lean towards Jones. Yeah. I'm going to lean towards Jones, but I have... I, that's not a hard lean. Featherweight, Damon Jackson and Kamuela Kirk. I don't feel too badly picking Jackson here. Uh... Yeah, Jackson. Women's flyweight, Sabina Mazzo and Miranda Maverick. Maverick is coming off of that rough loss. Uh, two of them, actually. The split with Macy Barber, which yeah, I kind of thought she won. But the loss to Blanchfield was uh, legit. Uh, whereas Mazzo, also on a two-fight losing. Yeah, going with Maverick. Middleweights, Dul uh, Dolce Lungiambula and Cody Brundage. Uh, Lungiambula uh, coming off of a loss. Brundage, by contrast. He lost his UFC debut. Oh, I thought Nick's, Nick Maximov. I'm going to go Brundage here. Might be very wrong. And Lungiambula is a powerful enough striker to absolutely turn Mr. Brundage's world upside down. But he's also been a bit weak in the cardio department, and he's been able to be wrestled. So, Bantamweight Guido Canetti and Chris Moutinho. Feel okay picking Canetti here. I know he's on a three-fight losing streak, but you know, Moutinho got a... They brought him in to lose. And he did. And everybody kind of went, oh, they should have let the fight, his fight with O'Malley continue. Uh-uh. I'm -uh. uh, going with Kennedy here. I don't, I don't know how, I don't know that Moutinho is really a UFC caliber fighter. And kicking everything off, we have uh, Tafon uh, Nchukwi and Azamat Mirzakhanov. Uh, Nchukwi, which I might be mispronouncing, so I apologize if I am. Uh, has gone two and one in the UFC. Beat Mike Rodriguez his last time out. Whereas Mirza Khanov is undefeated. And this is his UFC debut. Going with Mirza Khanov. Uh, yeah, that's where I lean. So, whatever that's worth. All right. That is it. That's UFC on ESPN plus 61. I will cover it in the MMA Zone of 411mania.com. So there's some decent stuff there. Uh, it, it's again, it's not the flashiest card, but you've got a relevant main event. Potentially the last stand of Marlon Marais. Um, yeah, there there's some stuff there. It's not great, but it's also kind of a random fight night. So you know, it is what it is. All right, let's. Yeah, let, let's do this, and we'll just try to be quick about it. So, former UFC heavyweight champion Cain Velasquez was arrested this last week for attempted murder. He, uh, I'm going to throw the allegedly caveat here. All of this that I'm about to discuss is alleged. There is evidence, but alleged. Um, allegedly, Velasquez drove, uh, chased down a man who stands accused of molesting and being physically abusing a, whenever they do this, you know it's because it's a minor, but a relative of Kane's. Uh, 
and he chased him down and then shot at him and hit the passenger in the car, which was, I believe, the alleged abuser's stepfather, something like that. Um, so he is in jail. He is being arraigned and charged and whatnot. Uh, what a terrible situation. I, I, I could do the macho thing and go, you know, yeah, you know, we'd all do that if we found out it was someone close to us that that had happened to, and you know, we we'd all want to go down and shoot him. Everybody says that. I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna say that. I'm gonna say the following. I understand the impulse. I think everyone does. Everyone understands the impulse to seek justice for something like that, assuming the allegations of abuse are accurate. I'm, I'm going to predicate my what follows on that. I don't spare a whole lot of uh, my emotional energy feeling bad for people who abuse children. I just, I, I don't have the, I don't have the time, I don't have the energy, if that's, the, if those are things you choose to do, I don't have a whole lot of sympathy for any, pretty much any bad thing that happens to you. I, I trust that I, I don't like to talk about my kind of my religious beliefs here a whole lot, but for the sake of expressing my opinions about this subject matter and sort of my worldview related to it, I suppose, I have faith that ultimately God will God is the supreme ju uh, arbiter of this, and He will pass judgment when the time is right. And I understand. Like I said I understand the impulse. And I am not unsympathetic to what Cain did. But, there's a big but, I also, for a variety of reasons, take a very dim view of extrajudicial violence. I just do. And it's, it's very easy to look at this situation and go, I would have done the same, or screw that guy in particular, given what he stands accused of, never mind that I'm going to say the following, and I want to make sure this is for, never mind that it might not be true. It might be 100% true, but it might not. And I just, I don't have a, I'm going to say this properly. If the guy had been... He was not out scot-free. He'd been granted bail and was currently, like, awaiting trial. Or he's, he's under arrest and... Like, he was granted bail. Now, you can argue whether or not that's an oversight. Or, you know, how wise it was for the judge to grant bail to this individual. That gets into specifics of... Uh, that I am not privy to. So, for the record, the prosecutor strongly objected to bail being granted, for whatever that's worth. Um, they usually, I mean, they always object, but usually when they go on the record for, like, strong objections, it's a, a bit of a different thing. But the prosecutor strenuously objected, for whatever that's worth. So, you can argue whether or not that's an oversight, but... This is not a guy who had gotten off. This is not a guy who... I don't know. I... I, again, your impulse is to be sympathetic. Because you'd all like to think that you'd do the same thing. Which is weird, but you all would. But the reality is, this is not how you want society to function. And that's kind of the point of systems. The I know some people got on Twitter and said the judicial system failed 
here, and I, I'm not convinced of that. The granting of bail, you can argue it's a mistake. You really can. The argument that this is somehow a failure of the system is a little bit of a reach for me. You would need to be privy to a lot of information that I'm not sure you are if you're posting about this on Twitter. I'm, I am, again, it, if Kane had shot and killed the guy he wanted to, I'm not shedding a tear over him, assuming the allegations are true. But I don't want society to function this way. This is not how I want things to be handled. And I don't think it's how you want them to be handled either. Because it's all well and good to puff out your chest and go, well, if it happened to someone I knew, or my you know, my granddaughter, my cousin, my nephew, my kid, whatever, my brother, my sister, I, again, whoever, whoever. It's all well and good to puff out your chest. It's all, we all understand the, the feeling. That moment when you know, the adrenaline kicks in and the blood drains out of your head just a little bit because you feel that, that's what they're. It's one of those things that if you if you study uh, real world violence, people watch for people who get beat red in the face, right? When they when they get really angry and they get amped up and your know, blood goes to the head. That's something you pay attention to, but that's not what worries you. Be worried when someone who was like that, in that position, be worried when the blood drains out of their head. Because that's a, that's an automatic response to the body preparing to fight. The blood comes away from the head. Uh, it's more necessary in other places. That's how you know, like, you know the feeling. Like you, you've, your heart, you become more aware of your heartbeat. A little bit of the, the blood pressure rises. Like we all know the impulse. Uh, whether we want to admit it or not. It's there. But you don't want society to function like this. And that's kind of how I have to look at this in some respects. So, I don't know what's going to happen with Cain Velasquez. I know that his family is not... Uh, I, my heart breaks for them, man. To have a some kind of family member, because this is a relative of Cain, so whatever that means, who now has to deal with recovery from physical abuse that that's that's a nightmare man that's just awful to begin with now you've got kane in jail on a charge charge of like first degree attempted murder public endangerment i mean the, dude brought a gun and shot somebody like you're gonna be stuck now you're gonna be stuck fighting this and this important figure in the family dynamic, whatever. He got up and he literally took up arms over this. So this is someone that there's a there's clearly some kind of importance, whatever the relationship happens to be. And now this person is in jail and probably going to be. It's it's just awful. And kind of the irony. If you want to call this irony, I suppose. If Kane hadn't brought the gun, if he had just tried to beat the guy to death with his bare hands, uh, might be facing lesser charges in some respects. Uh, yeah, it's it's an absolutely awful, awful situation, and uh, to the extent that new information becomes available, I will bring it up on occasion. But what a what an awful awful tragedy all right let's move on to slightly happier things i don't want to end on the downer there uh we have some fight cards being finalized ufc 273 and ufc 274 both had their fights revealed not the bout order for all of these but ufc 273 we uh we have i think they listed the full card but uh, the main card but i don't know that we got the full bout order but your main event Featherweight title fight, Alexander Volkanovsky and the Korean zombie, Chan Sung Jung. Good fight. Favor Volkanovsky as I think about it. But Jung hits really hard. Co-main event, bantamweight title fight, rematch between champion Aljamain Sterling and interim slash real champion Pyotr Jan. Favored Jan the first time, still favored Jan the second time, but a darn good fight. 
Also currently listed for the main card, as far as I know. Tisha Torres versus Mackenzie Duran. Pretty good fight. Kelvin Gastelum versus Nasruddin Imavov. That's a sneaky good fight. People are going to lo- overlook that one a little bit, but that's a good fight. Rest of the card's not bad. Irene Aldana and Aspen Ladd. Drikas Duplessis and Chris Curtis. That's one to keep an eye on. Uh, anything else stand out to me as I look at it? Mark Madsen and Vince Pichel. Uh, th- that's going to get... Uh, oh, sorry. How could I forget this one? Uh, Gilbert Burns and Kamzat Shemaev, the other main card fight there. Darn good fight. Pretty big test for Shemaev, but if he wins... Oof. That will take place April 9th. It's currently scheduled to happen in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, UFC 274, by contrast, set to take place in Phoenix because when one of the rare instances of the UFC taking one of the fighters of the main event towards their hometown, I suppose. Um, main event is Charles Oliveira defending the lightweight title against Justin Gagey. Gagey was uh, born in Stafford, Arizona, if memory serves. So, bit of a homecoming for him, potentially. Uh, that's a great fight, man. Just hook that crap into my veins. The rest of the card's a little bit weaker. Donald Cerrone and Joe Lozon is a fun enough old guy fight, I suppose. But uh, a rematch between Mauricio Shogun Hua and Ovin St. Preux that nobody wants. Blagoy Ivanov versus Marcos Rogerio de Lima. I fully expect to feature on my worst fight of the year list. Uh, Macy Chasson and Norma Dumont, Randy Brown, and Chaos Williams, Francisco Ronaldo, Danny Roberts, Brandon Royville, Matt Schnell. Royville and Schnell's not a bad fight. There's other fights listed here. Um, we were supposed to get Michelle Watterson and Amanda Hebos. That's out. Uh, Michelle Watterson announced she's uh, got an injury that she calls potentially career-ending. No more specifics other than that, so it seems to be serious. Slightly unfortunate, Watterson and Hebos would be a good fight, but I... I'd much rather the woman be healthy in her personal life than, you know, fight for my amusement. Like, your life's more important. So, those kind of got announced. Um, last little bit of... Eh, kind of fold this into the same place, I guess. Uh, same kind of thing. UFC 275 is supposed... Uh, they're targeting uh, Tyler Santos, challenging for the flyweight title. Women's flyweight against Valentina Shevchenko for UFC 275, so... Your public execution for the month of July is set. I kid. Uh, Santos is a good fighter. I just, I need a reason. I need a compelling reason to pick against Valentina, and I do not see one in Tyler Santos. So that's all the news I have. Let me check Twitter, and then we will get out of here. Uh, as for my plugs this week, Damn You Hollywood will feature a, on Tuesday will feature a review of The Batman, which is making all the waves at the moment. Uh, I think that's my only other podcast of the week. So myself, Mark Radulich, Andrew Graham, and Say Mercati will be tackling Matt Reeves' take on the Batman starring Robert Pattinson. So everyone else seems to love it. I haven't seen it yet, but I worry. When everyone else seems to love something, I tend to dislike it just because I have to be different. So we'll be reviewing that again Saturday on, or Tuesday on Damn You Hollywood. Uh, also this week, my usual sp- slate of professional wrestling coverage, UFC, uh, AW's Dark Elevation on Monday, MLW on Thursday, WWE SmackDown on Friday, and then the UFC event on Saturday per usual. We'll be back here next week for a review of UFC on ESPN Plus 61 and a preview of UFC on ESPN Plus 62 which is the UFC's return to London, and that main event might be in jeopardy, believe it or not. Current main event is Tom Aspinall and Alexander Volkov. The UK cut off visas for Russians, basically. So I don't know exactly how that's going to play out, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, We'll have a full preview of that next week either way, so if news is broken between now and then, we'll know a bit more one way or the other. All right. On that note, thank you all very, very much. Deeply appreciate it. Until next time, stay safe out there and continue to be well, be safe, and behave.